All right, Ephesians chapter 6. We continue in our study on who am I, our identity in Christ. And as we look at that identity, as, as I'm watching the news day by day and different crises, and I was talking to a mother just recently who has young, young, well, somewhat young kids in school, and the concerns that she had about this identity push that people are having in schools and praying for her daughters. I'm reminded of how important it is for us to understand who we are in Christ. And now at the end of this, as we come through, this is now the seventh part of this study as the final part of that series. How should we then live? In light of who we are in Christ and who he made us to be and what he wants us to do and the promises that he has made for us in the future, how should we live? And we've, we've been looking at chapters 4, 5, and 6. Ephesians, if you remember our study in Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3 tell us what a true born-again believer looks like. What someone who is a follower of Christ looks like. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 shows us what a spirit-filled believer looks like. And we're going to finish that part up tonight and begin. I'm not going to go through the part on the armor of God, but I want to at least introduce it if time should allow. But as we've been looking at this, we saw the contrast, chapters 4 and 5, between the old life and our new nature in Christ and what we should behave like now. And we saw there in chapter 5, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. And then later on down in verse 8, ye were once, ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light and then walk circumspectly, verse 15. And then redeeming the time, verse 16, but then walk filled with the Spirit. Be ye filled with the Spirit there in verse 18. And then it begins with a general description there in verses 18 to 21, what it looks like to, to walk in the Spirit. Then we looked last time at the family life. You say, well, that, walking in the Spirit, does it impact all of us? Yes. It's not just something that happens at church or at certain events. It should be a 24-7 proposition. And it talks about wives, how they submit to their husbands. Husbands, you love your wives and you submit to the needs that your wife has. And then children, you submit to your parents, you obey your parents and honor them. And parents, you also, the basic thing is you submit to the needs of your kids to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And that goes back to that, that overarching theme there in verse 21 of chapter 5, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So authority and submission are the two pillars of God's structure for all of humanity, for the family life, for the church life, for the culture, for society, for everything. You have one who is authority and you have one who submits. But at either point, whether you're in authority or you're the one under that authority, you're all to submit one to another. Because with God, there is no respect of persons. He loves everyone equally. There's no male or female. There's no bond or free. If we're in Christ, we are loved of God equally. And therefore, that relationship is there. But for structure, for order, and to do the will of God, there is the need to submit one to another. Now we come down to the last part of that. Here in verses 5 through 9, Ye servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whosoever, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master, notice the capital M there, also, your master also in heaven, neither is there respect to persons with him. So as we look at this, these are principles now it goes beyond just the home with the, the husband and wife and the structure for the marriage 
and the parents and children and the structure there as they raise that next generation to then become parents on their own right and raise their children. And, a, and that, that was the structure that God made. But what about society? What about as we go into the workplace and the marketplace, if no one submits and everyone wants to be the boss, we're going to have trouble. But if everyone wants to submit and nobody wants to be the boss, then you also have trouble, right? So there's a structure there. But understand when Paul's speaking here, he's talking in a context when he says there in verse 5, servants, be obedient. The word servant there is douloi. It's a bondservant, a slave. So this was someone that, while the Bible does not endorse slavery, it also does not preach against slavery, does it? Now, it certainly does against kidnapping for the sake of using someone to gain profit off of them. That, in fact, that was condemned back in the Old Testament. But the truth is, there was slavery all over the world, and you didn't see Paul making that an issue and trying to do all these things regarding the slaves, and Jesus didn't do it. The disciples and apostles didn't do it. So is it right or wrong? Well, it's wrong. Now, there was a type of slavery that was endorsed by Scripture and was right. When a thief stole from someone and he didn't have the resources to make restitution, he could become an indentured slave to that person to work off his debt. That was condoned by Scripture. Or when someone was in hard times and they needed to borrow, they could then indenture themselves to the one who loaned them what they needed until they could repay that and then they were free again. But here's another interesting thing about the gospel. Wherever the gospel went, slavery ceased over time. You saw that throughout Paul's day and those parts of the world. We saw it here in America. Today, slavery is not an issue. So this concept, but servants here speaks, it's not just to those who were slaves who were literally bound to their, they were the property of their masters. It extends over into the employer-employee relationship as well, as we will see. So be obedient, that is the what. Remember, we've been looking at the what, the how, and the why, and the attitudes with which we do it. So the what is, you be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. And that word be obedient there is in the present tense, so it says you keep on being obedient. It's a, it's a constant obedience. So I understand my role. If I'm not the boss, then I work for someone who's over me, and my task is to be under their authority. Now, if we live in a free country where we have the freedom to simply say, okay, well, if you're asking me to do something the Lord has said I cannot do, then I must remove myself from that and go someplace where I can obey the Lord. But there are situations where you don't have that choice, and sometimes believers have to take a stand and take the penalty that that brings from that master who is wicked. But the, the concept of being obedient to them, have you ever heard someone, a, a, a boss comes up and gives the instruction to the employee, says, I want you to do this, and then the boss walks away, and wh what do they often say? I don't get paid enough to do that. I'm not doing that. Have you ever heard that? I've heard it. I remember when I got my first job at Kmart, back in Martinsville when I was in the 11th grade. And, and I got hired on, I went in, worked, I was, got hired on as a cashier. But after a while, the personnel manager came to me and said, would you be interested in learning different departments so you can relieve them for break? I said, sure. It gets, at certain times of night, it gets real boring here at the cashier, you just stand there. And so I'd rather be doing something, so I'd do that. and then. I'd see that the hangar bins needed to be emptied. It wasn't my job, but I did it. And if they needed somebody to sweep the floors, I'd say, hey, I can walk around pushing the broom just as well I can stand there looking pretty at the cash register. So I, I just, and to me, that was just normal. That was what you do. I'd rather be doing something than nothing. And then there were other people that had been there 30 years, one lady in particular. And she was an assistant manager in, in the evenings, and she would close the store, I mean, close the registers, had another manager to close the store. But it wasn't, I wasn't yet off my probation period, you know, as a new employee, before she offered me the position of being assistant 
supervisor of the cash registers. The same as that lady who'd been there 30 years. And she did not like that. But when she got there, she said, I don't get paid to clean out the hanger bins. I don't get paid to do this. I don't get paid to, I get paid to, and she did what she got paid for. But that was, that's, that's the idea that, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. And when you work, you transport that over into ministry, in which sometimes you're working with volunteers. Now imagine someone who's not even paid to do a certain job. They volunteer to do it, but they work under the supervision of someone who's over them. And how do you as the leader over someone that's a volunteer, how do you lead them? So there's a relationship, but when we are in Christ and walking in the Spirit, that should never become an issue, and we'll know why here in a moment. So the what is we're to be obedient to your masters according to the flesh. Now that's a reminder that if you were a slave in that day, know that this type of relationship and this type of oppression, if you have a, a, an evil master, it is only bound to this lifetime. It will not go into eternity. Things will not be that way in eternity. You honor the Lord. You obey the, your, your masters in the flesh. And notice the how. It's going to give us several things in the next three verses. First of all, with fear and trembling. Now, this is not I'm scared to death and I shy away because I'm afraid they're going to smack me. It's in the sense of honor and respect. Okay? They're the authority over me. They're the boss. Then we respect them and honor their position. And so that, that's the concept there. We, we need to have that respect about us. And then the next one, in singleness of your heart, that means in sincerity of your heart. It doesn't mean you do the job, but you do it mumbling and grumbling and griping all the way. You do it with sincerity of heart. So that means when I do it, I'm going to do it with heart. And there are passages that we'll read the moment that speak to that. But singleness of heart, that sincerity, that honesty about it. In fact, 1 Peter, let me read that now, 2, 18 through 20. It talks about this situation of the servants, especially those who are slaves. It said, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. What is froward? Not forward, but froward. What does that mean? It means perverse, evil. You ever had a boss that took delight in causing you irritation or in making you mad or making your job more difficult? I think I had one like that at one time. But most of the time, I, I'm thankful I've had pretty good supervisors or bosses. Most of the time, not always did we agree. And when they got upset, you know, you us they usually took it out on you. But for the most part, they were pretty good. But here, some people say, well, you don't know my boss. Well, the scripture kind of covers that when it says, not just to the good and gentle, but also to those who are perverse and difficult. For verse 19, 1 Peter 2, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongly, for what glory is it if when he is buffeted for your faults, because you did wrong, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well, and suffer for it. You take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. So under the conditions, even when we're doing right and we get punished for it, you keep enduring that and that is acceptable with the Lord. And we'll see something at the end of this section that should comfort our hearts if we're in that situation where it's difficult to submit to someone like that. 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2 also, he talks about the contrast or, or the similarities between working for an unsaved boss, or for a saved boss. It says Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2, says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now what's Paul saying here? He's telling Timothy, look, if you are an employee to someone, you treat them, you give them all honor so that you, the name of God and your faith, your doctrine, does not get drugged through the mud. You see, when we are at work, our Christian testimony, the God we serve, we claim to be a child of God, and we claim to believe the scriptures, 
He said, if by your behavior you bring uh, disrespect upon the scriptures, then what good is your testimony? Your salt and your light, as we were studying Sunday. And then in verse 2, he says, and they that have believing masters. In other words, your, your boss is a Christian. Let them not despise them because they are brethren. In other words, don't take advantage of them because they are Christians. Oh, my boss is good to me and he's a Christian. He'll never fire me. So I can kind of be a slacker on the job and do a half, half job or, you know, that sort of thing. But no, it says don't do that. It says because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And those are principles. He's telling Timothy, you teach the church to do this. And we should do the same. Not just in the employment area, but any place, whether it be in the church or in a ministry, whether it be in the home or anywhere, as those working under some authority, you do it with this type of attitude. So you do it, number one, with honor and respect. Number two, with sincerity of heart. And... Let me read 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 through 12. It says, And indeed ye do it toward all brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. How we go about doing things with that sincerity of heart We'll bear our testimony no matter what job we're doing, whether we're the master or the servant. And that, that purity of heart. And it goes into the next phrase here, as unto Christ. You do it with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Now this kind of eliminates, well, you don't know my boss. Well, your boss isn't your boss. Your ultimate boss is whom? Christ. Who endured all things for us. He endured the persecution, he endured the suffering, he endured the cross, he endured the grave. And then he rose again and he offered salvation to us. We are who we are because of what he did. So as we do whatever minor thing we suffer here on this earth, by comparison to what he did, we do it as unto him and it becomes easy to do it, no matter how difficult it may be. So verse 6, he says, not with eye service. Now, what's that? Eye service as men pleasers. That means when the boss is here, I work good. But when he leaves, Brazilians have a, an expression. Quando gato sai, o rato faz festa. In other words, when the cat leaves, the mice have a party. And that kind of speaks to when the boss leaves, the employees, they, they just sit down, relax, and have a party while he's gone because he can't do anything about it. Well, he's saying you don't do that. You don't work as men pleasers, doing eye service only when you're being watched, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Now, that, that, that all of a sudden changes everything. If I'm not doing it for someone else, especially someone that is mean to me, that is unfair to me, but I'm doing it as unto the Lord who has given me everything then how do I justify not doing a good job? How do I justify doing something with less than a, than a sincere heart? 1 Corinthians 10.31 reminds us, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And this applies across the board. Husbands and wives, parents and children, children to parents, employees to their masters. So we do it, as servants of Christ, doing the will of God. Notice that phrase again. It is God's will that we submit. Remember the five steps in God's will before we get to step number six, which is do what you want? Salvation is first step. Then the filled with the Spirit is number two. Sanctification is number three. Submission is number four. And then what's the fifth one? Suffering. And if you're doing all those things, as Delight yourself also in the Lord, and that's what you're doing when you do those five steps. What's the number six? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you what? The desires of your heart. And I found that to be true. So whatever you do, you do, you do God's will, 
according to verse 6 here. And notice verse 7, with good with good will. Now, this is not another part of how we do it, and that is with the right attitude. You do it with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Now, that is the third time he has mentioned this. In verse 5, as unto Christ. Verse 6, as the servants of Christ. Verse 7, doing service as to the Lord, not to men. Why do you suppose Paul mentions that three times in three consecutive verses? Because he knows the heart of men too. And the old nature is when we get irritated, we get upset, or we get frustrated, we decide, okay, forget this, I'm going to do it my way. And he's saying, no, we don't do it that way. We do it with good will. There's one time that is particularly hot weather, and it's a particularly nasty job of digging a ditch one time. It's just not pleasant. And we were down there di digging the ditch, and some delivery guy came to deliver some things. And my younger brother, Stephen, he was down in that hole, and he was just swinging that pick as hard as he could swing it and singing to the top of his lungs. I mean, everybody could hear it. And the delivery guy, he comes to me and says, is he okay? <laughs> I said, why do you ask? He said, I mean, it's a hot day. You're down in the ditch digging a ditch. He's singing like it's his favorite thing to do. <laughs> I said, well, I said, it's my brother. I said, he is a little off. But, but, you know, that's the way a Christian ought to be. We're going through all these things, and then you're still doing it as unto the Lord and doing it with goodwill. And that, that's when a boss will stop and say, wait a second. This isn't normal. And you'll be surprised how many people who started off under the antagonism of a boss, turned around with his blessing and even promotion because God honored their faithful testimony. Well, that's the how. Now let's look at the why. Verse 8, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth. So no matter what you do and you think, okay, well, I'm going to toot my horn here. I've got a bad boss, and I'm a good worker, and I'm doing it with goodwill, so at least I should brag about it since nobody else appreciates it, right? Look at this. It says, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Don't look for your reward from men. It will come from God. He will reward you whether your boss does or not. He will reward you, and you can apply this in the husband-wife relationship. You can apply it to the parent-child relationship. And there are some horror stories that we could tell that we have observed over the years. And even in the workplace and in, in, under slavery conditions, the stories that we have heard or read about. But yet how some people just simply commit it to the Lord and they serve the Lord no matter what, and how God turns that around. I was... In one of the books I was reading this week, there's a story about a missionary coming back from Africa where he had been missionary for 40 years. And they were leaving, coming home in retirement. And after 40 years of service there in Africa, they were coming on this ship. And President, I think, was it Franklin Roosevelt? It was on the ship. It was one of the Roosevelts who was president was on the ship coming back. He had had a very successful hunting trip in Africa for three weeks. And he was on the same ship coming in, and as they pulled into the New York Harbor, they, uh, there's all these people there to greet him and cheer and this reception for him, and not a soul there to meet this missionary coming home after 40 years. As they're riding in the taxi from the ship over to the hotel where they would spend the night, the missionary was kind of hurt. And he turned to his wife and said, you know, he said, he's gone for three weeks and he gets all the fanfare in this. We've been serving the Lord for 40 years, preaching the gospel and not a soul here to even receive us or acknowledge it. And then as they prayed, you know, when they got to the hotel, they were eating, they prayed, and before they went to bed, they, they came to the conclusion and said, well, we need to remember that we're not home yet. And when we get home, there's... That one who keeps the records, he is the righteous judge, and he rewards righteously. 
He will give. He keeps the books, and he will reward according to what we have done. And uh, that's something we need to keep in mind. No matter what we're going through, just know that whatever you do, God is the one who rewards you. Now, let's go from being the employee to being the boss for a moment. It's amazing how many people would like to be the boss or think they would like to until you do it. And all of a sudden, the pressure is on you, the accountability is on you, and all the criticism is aimed at you. That's all part of the package. And then before long, they say, you know, I don't want this. Well, he has instructions here for the masters, and this is whether they were masters over slaves or employers over employees. It would apply even to this day. It says verse 9, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening. In other words, don't threaten. Knowing that your master also is in heaven, and neither is there respect to persons with him. Now, this, this is a, a very strong statement. I want you to look at this. He goes through verses 5 through 9, and specifically verses 5 and 6, because 7 and 8 are a commentary on verses 5 and 6. So what did he say in verses 5 and 6 to the servants? He said, you be obedient to your masters according to the flesh. You treat them with fear and, or with respect and honor. You be sincere and you treat them, you work for them as you would for Christ. Don't do it with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And then he turns to the masters and the boss and says, now before you get all puffed up and start pointing your finger at the employees. Now see there, you better shape up. He says, you do the same thing to them. You remember the phrase, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord? See, this is the thing. Submission is not the right for whoever's responsible to beat up on the one who's under their responsibility or authority. In fact, it's saying you submit to each other. There are needs those employees have, and you are to submit to those needs, and you treat them with the respect and honor wherewith you want to be treated as well. You treat them as sincerely as you want them to treat you sincerely as they work for you. And all of a sudden, in just one phrase, he says, you do the same thing and don't threaten them. Don't you sit there and say, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to fire you. If you don't do it. How many parents do this to their kids? Uh, if you don't do this, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to get this. Or if you don't do that, you're not going to get this. If you do this, I'm going to tell your dad when he gets home. And we threaten them. That's not the reason they ought to obey is because they're afraid of what dad might do when he gets home. They ought to obey because it is right. Remember back in verses, uh, which one is it? Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. That's what we teach them. You do the will of God because it's the right thing to do. Not because I might get spanked or not because dad might punish me in this way or that. And same thing for the employer to the employee. Do not threaten. But you treat them the same way you want them to treat you. And then this final phrase. This is kind of a, a reminder to all of those in authority. Knowing that your master capital M. Who's he speaking of? The Lord. We are all to be submissive to the Lord, no matter what position we're in of authority or of submission. We are to be submissive to him. Your master, who also in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. He doesn't care if you're bond or if you're free. He doesn't care if you're the boss or the employee. He doesn't care if you're the husband or the wife. He doesn't care if you're the parent or the child. He is the one who's keeping the, keeping the score, and he is your master, and you submit to him. And that's why th this, this structure of authority and submission is very clear, but it's not as the world sees it. That verse, the key verse to remember there is back in verse 21 of chapter 5, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. So what does spirit-filled life look like? Well, in general and things, verses 18 to 21. Wives, verses 22 to 24. Husbands, verses 25 to 33. Children, verse, chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. 
and masters or employers, employees, verses 5 to 9 of chapter 6. That's what it, that's what it looks like. And the principles over in chapter 5 that speak, that lead up to how this is. This is what happens. Chapter 1 to 3, what a true believer is. Chapters 4 to 6, what it looks like when he's walking in the Spirit, the way he should be. But that brings us, and I want to int- just begin to introduce this, because, and I want to hit it much harder next week, because I want to do it more as a unit. But it's interesting how the Lord has brought to my heart, as I've been sharing over the past few messages, a theme. And it was there Sunday, as we looked at that, the, the character of, of salt and light. And when, when he describes the salt and light, he's describing also the conditions in which we as believers are going to live, in which we are going to minister. The world, is, salt was a preservative to slow or stop decay. Remember that? Light was there to dispel the darkness, and that's more of an active uh, witness and, or testimony of Christ. But it was there as Christians, true born-again believers, we are there to slow the wickedness in the world and to share the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And that's, that's kind of a summary of what those two are. We ask the question, why does God leave Christians in the world? He could take us home at the moment we're saved. We could be out of here. But he doesn't. And he doesn't because he has chosen us to be those, those elements. The Spirit indwells us, and he allows us to have that quality of salt. That works from within, silently. It works invisibly. But it's independent of what it preserves or what it adds taste to or causes thirst. But it has that effect that will either slow evil or will promote righteousness. And then light, it's very different. It's very overt because when there's darkness and light shows up, the darkness flees, right? And that's what a Christian ought to be. They can't help but see the light. In fact, he says, you don't light a candle and then put that, that measuring bowl over it because then nobody can see the light. You light the candle so everyone can see it. And we are light. He didn't say you need to become light. He said you are light. The moment you're saved... You are salt and you are light. The question is, are we hiding that light? But the conditions in which we are salt and light, it means there's a decaying world, and we know that the world is dying and decaying from sin. And we know that there is darkness in the world. And that is where we are called to minister. And I've been sharing over the past few months, from time to time, that theme that we are at war. We are in a spiritual war war and when we get complacent and we think that well you know we're really not persecuted we're really not the world is kind of becoming more uh, favorable and friendly to Christians aren't they more tolerant and the minute you think that you need to check yourself out you need to check your spiritual uh, health out at that point why well what we're going to see here look here in chapter 6 verse 10 This is going to introduce, and I'm just going to touch on it, and then we'll pick it up here next Wednesday, Lord willing. But chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, brethren. Now he's closing out the whole argument of the book. Chapters 1 through 3, what a Christian is. Chapters 4 through 6 and verse 9, how the Christian should walk, especially filled with the Spirit. But now in verse 10, finally, my brethren. Notice he's talking to believers. He says, You be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now stop there for a minute. The strength of a believer does not come from his church. It does not come from how many years he has been a Christian. It does not come from how much he knows of the scriptures. And sadly, sometimes we think that's the case. Sometimes we come to the point that we think, well, you know, I've been in church long enough, and I've been doing this long enough, and I think I know what's what, and I I, I can deal with this on my own. Well, it says, when he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He's reminding of something that Jesus told his disciples. Back in John chapter 15, he says, without me, you can do what? Nothing. Just as there's a vine and the branches and the branches apart from the vine, they cannot live, they cannot bear fruit. So are we in Christ. Apart from him, we can do nothing. The apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, who 
which strengtheneth me. And that, that is a, that's an imperative that we understand. And when we stop and think, okay, well, why do I need strength? Why do I need power? Well, look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, now wait a second. What's this armor thing you're talking about now? I came to Jesus so I'd find peace, not war. I came to Jesus so that I would be at ease and not in turmoil and in despair every day. Well, you need to understand that as soon as you come to Jesus, and you're truly born again, chapters 1 to 3, and you're walking in the Spirit and pleasing the Lord, chapters 4, 5, and 6, the devil's not going to be happy. And the devil is our enemy. And we're going to look at the different names and titles that he has. And we're going to read through some of the passages of Scripture that describe the relationship of the devil to, the, to mankind. And what we must understand about the one who is our enemy. And I want you to understand this. When he says put on, that word is in a tense that means you put it on and never take it off. Now, I don't know about you. If I go out and I'm working outside and I come inside, I like to get out of those clothes and get changed. When I get a haircut, I like to go and take a shower, get out of those clothes and change into something else. If I'm out shoveling snow and I have all that bulk, I can't wait to get inside and get that off. Get on something comfortable. And I don't, when I picture putting on armor, armor is usually not seen as very comfortable, is it? But here's the thing that believers must know and understand. If you are living for the Lord the way you should be, and if we are indeed walking in the Spirit, the enemy will not like it, and he is going to attack us. I want you to look at this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's the source of strength. It is not you and anything you do. Now, it doesn't mean we, shouldn't, we need to understand the Lord's strength. We need to know his word. We need to be with his people. We need to grow in grace and knowledge. We need to walk with the Lord. That's what the spirit-filled life does. We can't do that if we're not obeying the Lord in the small things in life. But then you put on that armor of God. And we're going to look at that in detail next week. You put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles. The word wiles there means it's from the word methodia, from which we get the word method. And this speaks of the schemes of the devil, the methods of the devil to get you to violate God's will for your life or the, the will of God. So that you can stand against the, the wiles of the devil, the slanderer. All right, let's stop for a moment. Have you ever heard people preach? And I, and I, I remember hearing some preachers, they, they had a different theology, a different doctrine, but they had a strange doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And they would urge their congregation and say, you need to go out there, you need to go find the devil and beat him up. Go find those demons and beat them up because they can't beat you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The problem is you never find that in Scripture. Nowhere does God say you go after the devil. Don't, he, he never says go fight the devil. In fact, we can't fight the devil. It's interesting when the devil contended with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses. What did Michael the archangel do? One of the strongest, he's considered, as my theology professor who was a Marine, he said Michael was the Marine. Gabriel was the, the Navy guy, but Michael was the Marine. But even when he was confronted by Satan, he simply rebuked him in the name of the Lord. The power was God's, not Michael's even as a powerful angel. But it notice something else is that you may be able to stand. And that word stand there is the same word that's used in scriptures as a military when you're holding a position. It's, it's not something you're advancing to take new territory. You're simply where God placed you, doing what God told you to do, fulfilling God's will for your life, and here comes the devil because he's not pleased with it, and he's going to try to divide it. Now, let me ask you a question. We seem to think, hey, we're doing okay. We're here at church. We don't have big fist fights and, and all these knockdown drag outs in our church and all this. We're thankful that we have a peaceful place. 
Well, one, one author put it this way. If we understand Ephesians chapter 6 and other passages of Scripture correctly, one of the most dangerous places to be is in church. Because that is where some spiritual battle is going to be taking place if we are indeed preaching the truth of the Word of God and we are practicing the truth of the Word of God. That means we're applying what we're learning to our lives and living it out as we allow the Spirit to control us, which is the whole thing. How should we then live? Well, as we're seeing in this last part of the book, we should live very cautiously, understanding we are at war. We do have an enemy who wants nothing less than to steal everything that God has in store for us. For an unbeliever, he wants to blind his eyes so that he does not see the light of the gospel. To the believer, he wants to distract him from the, God's will so that he does not receive the reward that he does not accomplish what God has laid out for him to do. And all we have to do to make the devil successful is to do what he wants. Not do what God says. Not walk in the spirit. Continue walking in the flesh and doing the same things I used to do when I was an unbeliever. And you're fulfilling the will of the devil. If I want to fulfill the will of God, then all of a sudden we were darkness, now we're light. We walk as children of light. We're filled with the Spirit, and then we follow the description there at the end of chapter 5 and first part of chapter 6. But know this. We are at war. It's a spiritual warfare. It's not, uh, it's not a group that wears military uniforms and has tanks and all that. It's, a, it's far scarier than that and we'll look at that a little more next time let's pray father as we examine what it is to live in christ and lord to walk in the spirit and to know that now that we are born again believers there should be a total transformation night and day in our lives lord if we're to walk as children of light and as we studied sunday we're to be salt and light in this world and influence our world for christ then we're going to have to allow the Spirit to have His way in our lives. And as we do, we need to understand the world is not going to like it, the devil's not going to like it, and he will oppose us. Lord, help us to understand that greater is he that, in, that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater is that Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who indwells every born-again believer and grants him the power and the wisdom and the ability to stand against those methods of the devil. But Lord, if we're not walking in the Spirit and not yielding to Him, we will fall. Help us, Lord, to understand, to learn, and to walk as you would have us to walk. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.